one want to sing in the choir? Feel free to come help us. Start out with number six.
Brother Jerry, can you turn up Teddy's mic? He can't hear it. Because I 
called it an unspoken prayer request, but yet I said what it was. So, but uh, they have found some spots in her breast and possibly her lymph nodes. She's going for testing for cancer and stuff. If y'all will, please keep her in your prayers and stuff. She's really scared and and uh, she needs the Lord in her life as well. Remember this quick. <coughs> Remember Israel. They were on a ceasefire right now, but things could get hot and be threatened. So just, right. just remember Israel. Remember that. I also have one, Brother Cliff. Yeah. Anybody else? I spoke of prayer request. Let's go. Come on.
Praise the Lord. Doesn't it feel right this morning? I love it when things feel right. Yes. I love it when the presence of God comes into a place and it, and it just feels like this is where I belong this morning. For whatever time, whatever uh, opportunity, that this feels so good and so right this morning. I just wish that everybody in the world could be here this morning and feel what I feel. You know, the last time I preached in this pulpit, I was a missionary. Today, I'm kind of like what some of them said, they're trying to retire me, but I'm not ready to retire yet. As long as I can still preach, I'm going to preach, and I feel right at home this morning. So I'm not a missionary this morning as I stand before you. I'm just a preacher of the gospel, and we want to share the word of God with you for just a little while this morning. It's good to be here. Now you, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to ask your indulgence a little bit because we're pretty mind foggy this morning. We, we uh, come into, we come into the, the house we bought over here in Shipley. Supposed to have gotten our stuff Tuesday, and they bring it in late yesterday afternoon, and so we didn't get to bed till late last night, and and we, and it's just a maze of boxes and stuff stuck everywhere. And everything, I was out looking for my eye drops. I forgot them. I told my wife, I said, it's a good thing that we don't have false teeth in the glass eye or I'd be one-eyed and toothless this morning. So I don't seem like I can remember the things that I need to remember. But it's good to be here. I've, I've been here in this pulpit several times and enjoyed these same kind of services over and over now, you forgive me if I don't remember a lot of names, but I surely do remember your faces. Yes. I do remember them. And I can't see as far back as I used to be, as I used to could back there, but uh, to make out, but I, I do remember. I was sitting there this morning, and I said, oh, I said, I don't know who that is. Don't know their name, but I know who that is. And I remember <laughs> over the years that we got to come here. Turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. And verse 7. Now I'm just a simple man. Nothing complicated about me whatsoever. I'm just a simple preacher of the gospel. 51 years ago I started preaching it. And I preach and believe the same thing that I started 51 years ago. <clears throat> and so that's what I want to share with you this morning. You know there's a lot of. Stuff going on that calls itself preaching. That calls itself teaching. But it's so far from the true word of God. Because it's designed to tickle the flesh. It's designed to make us feel good about ourselves. The, the warm and fuzzy things. But I said to the Lord this morning. When I get here I want to preach myself under conviction. How long has it been since you've been preached under conviction? <laughs> I need that. I need to be preached under conviction. If I have, if I can't find anybody else to do it, then I'll do it myself. I'll preach to myself and bring myself under conviction. And so that's what we want to do. We want to look at God's Word this morning for a little while. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. It said, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now this text that I read to you this morning has, uh, it has often been misrepresented in its meaning. Uh, especially today and the time that we live in. But it simply means that God breathed into a man 
the breath of life, and that man became a living soul. Notice it did not say a living being became a man. It said a man became a living being. It became a living soul. Now the, the evolutionists teach us that a living thing, a protoplasm, as, as I, I jotted down here, or some microscopic glob of life formed and then evolved eventually into a man. Now, I never could quite understand why the nations of the world could believe in the Darwinian theory of evolution because when Darwin and his disciples boiled it all down, they made a bold declaration, and that was that all other forms of human life except the white race, and though only the superior ones in the white race had fully developed, and all the rest of the nations of the world were continuing to develop in, they were subhuman at that point, and they were, they were, they were uh, evolving or trying to evolve into a man. But the Bible tells us that God breathed into that first man, just like he breathes into every baby that's born the breath of life and that baby becomes a living being that child, that individual, that person that God breathed into they become a living soul, a living being Bless you. Bless you. now, no man <coughs> or speaking of man in general using the word man generically here as mankind I want to divide them this morning into two groups because the title of my message this morning is From Dust to Glory. That's where we were brought, from dust to glory. Yes. And there is two groups here and only two groups. There are not a lot of groups, but there's only two groups this morning in this. And that in dividing them into this two groups because this is what the Word of God teaches. Group number one, is the group of people, which is mostly the millions and millions of this world, they're on a journey. But they're only on one journey. They're on a journey from dust back to dust. They are the, they are the individuals, they have already rejected Christ. They will not accept the gospel. They live in a rebellious state, and they will enter into eternal damnation. This journey of this group of people on the earth is one from dust back to dust. is a physical journey. Yes. But there is another group of people. This is yes. God's people. They're on two journeys. They're not only are we on a journey of dust back to dust as far as the physical is concerned, but I'm glad this morning that we are on another journey. We are on a spiritual journey, and that spiritual journey is from the dust that we are of this earth, but we're going further back. We're going to the glorious glory. gospel and the glorious uh, 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 glory that God has for his believers and his, his people. Uh, we are on this second journey. There's two in our life. You're, we're going to go back to the dust of the earth. We're going to go back to the cemetery. That's sure, unless Jesus comes first. But we're on a second journey. We're on a spiritual journey. That's not going to end in the dust. Hallelujah. That's going to end in the glory of God. We're going to go to glory. And in the things of glory. And we'll be made into the likeness and the gloriousness of our Lord. Now, this is a spiritual journey, and this is what my message is about to you this morning, to the true church, where you see there's a true church and there's a false church. And my message is to the true church tonight, or today from dust to glory. Yes. Our Bible declares that God breathed into man, the first man, the breath of life, and man became a living soul. All men became living souls. Now let us look at that for a few moments this morning. And now if you want to get excited and shout a bit, this, this is a, what they call Pentecost Sunday. So if you want to get Pentecostal, go ahead. I mean, we've had a, a thorough lesson this morning and, and a, a confirmational lesson for me because he, he touched slightly on, on what I'm speaking about this morning in the lesson. But uh, we've already had that well explained to us. But if you want to have one of those Pentecostal experiences, 
Go ahead and do it. Uh, if you want to have it by yourself, if you want to have it as a group, but let's let's let God move in our midst and in the service uh, this morning and let's praise his name. I want us to look at this idea just a little bit. That this life is one of moving uh, from dust to glory. You see, at creation, uh, man was made in the image of God. God breathed into that man the breath of life. Man became a living soul. How glorious is that? He was the image bearer of God. Uh, he was made in the likeness of God, the image of God. When God breathed that breath into him, he became a living soul. That individual at that time was raised from that dust into a glorious position of what God had made him to be, and that glorious image and image bearer of God. At creation, he was made in the image of God, and from dust to the glorious image as God breathed into that man and brought him out of the dust and made him a living soul. Then man failed. Sin came on the scene. Sin was introduced into the life of the human race, and, the, and, the, and that sin caused man, now who was made like in a glorious state, made in, a, in, a, in an image like unto God, now that man fell, and because of that, that man lost the image of God. He lost the true image, and he no longer could represent God. He could no longer, he could no longer be that, be that image barrier of God. And so God and God began to, to prepare a way by which man could be brought back from now that corrupted condition that he was in because of the fall and because of sin. And he no longer can bear the image of God. And God through Christ and redemption made a way by which man then could come back into that pathway from that dust, from that lost condition, that separated condition, that inability to bear the image of God anymore and, and gave man an opportunity opportunity for redemption and brought man back to that place and now man in from the physical dust and that's where we are this morning but the redeemed remember on two journeys now in this physical dust that we are in through redemption God has brought us now back to the glorious nature and image of Christ and we now only because we have been born again only because we've been redeemed now we are true image bearers again of God we now can bear that image of God rightly you see man's journey from dust to glory is a long one it starts from creation and goes to the end and it starts with each one of us the day that we're born that's when my journey started. That's when your journey started. But it's a long path from creation, from Genesis to Revelation to the consummation. But it is a journey from dust to glory. It is a journey from the condition that man fell from into, as an image bearer of God. And now the sting of death for the believer has been taken out. We know what the sting of death is. Paul said it's sin. That's been removed. The sting of death is taken out. And though physically I'm going to go back to the dust that I came from. Amen. If Jesus tarries and the rapture doesn't take place. We're going to end up in a cemetery somewhere. We're going back to the dust. But we as believers are not yes. only in that physical condition. But brothers and sisters this morning. We are in the spiritual condition that we are being glorified. Hallelujah. And being made into the image of Christ in our walk. And that will be our consummation. That will be our end. Yes. Amen. Yes. This is a journey. Many sermons have been preached about it in the church house and at the grave sites, and books of theology and secular books have been written about the subject. It's an inexhaustible subject of man returning to the dust, but also the Bible is inexhaustible of the testimony of those in Christ are going to be resurrected to eternal glory. Yes. You see, this resurrection, this death, this dust, 
to glory is not a morbid thing that we think about and the, and the finality of it is at the grave site. This is a glorious thing. It's the beginning for you and I. Yes. It's this glorious state that we will be in as we move on in to the likeness of Christ. Now I want to touch on it for just a few minutes in this message with you. Let's look at the thought of man at creation. God created man, Genesis 1, 27, in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created him them. Now, I believe that 51 years ago, and I believe it this morning. Amen. That's right. I believe it's gospel truth, it's the word of God. God created them, and he created them in his image. So we might say that man is uh, I'm going to use a long theological word this morning. Man is theomorphic, but it simply means he's made in the image of God. Yes. He is now, at Adam before he fell, was the image bearer of God. And in that condition, in, 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 in his created condition before he failed, man became the image of God, and God raised that body that laid there in the dust, Adam, which is a prototype of all of us, and all of us go back to that. But as he laid there in the dust, God then breathed into that perfect stature of a man, that perfect created being, sinless, perfect in all of his ways, lying there. But until God breathed into that man, the breath of life had just laid there. But God breathed into him. God put his spirit into him that we talked about this morning. God puts his spirit into us. Yes, right. The spirit of God, the breath of God. There's a scripture, I don't remember exactly where it's found, but it talks about the, the, uh, the, the soul of man or the light of man is the candle of God. That candle, that light that's within him. And so God, when he created him, created his image, and he rises from that dust, that he's in, into the glorious image of God. If you would have been there that morning and been able to watch and see what took place, hear this body, Adam lays there in the dust that he was formed from in God's own hand right. as he laid him there and lifeless, perfect form laying there but God breathed into Adam the breath of life and Adam come to life and got up. That would have been a glorious sight because this is a perfect man now in the perfect image of God and bearing what God desired man to be. Yes, you see, God's intent for Adam was that Adam would live forever. Yes, yes. He never intended for Adam to die. Right, right. You see, God doesn't, God doesn't make mistakes, neither is he caught second-guessing. I think it was Watchman Nee said one time, an architect, Drew the blueprints of a high building, many floors up. While in the process of building that building, a man fell to his death. But now the architect didn't draw that man falling to his death. And the architect of heaven did not draw the fall. He did not put the fall of man in his plans, but knew it, therefore made provision after the fall. And so God now has Adam in his perfect form and everything. And Adam raises from that glory to become the image of God. How glorious is that this morning to know that you and I as image bearers of Christ, that you and I are in our glorified spiritual state right now. How wonderful is that to us today, hallelujah. How wonderful is to know where we are and what we are and what we're bringing forth. But religion, religion has elevated man to a godlike position in his own eyes. Yeah. Man thinks he's a god today more than they used to. Yeah. Folks have always acted like they were a god. But this is what religion and it has elevated man to a godlike position, and in his eyes, he is equal to his creator. Yeah. It is fall. He lost the image of God and he took on the image of himself. And that's all that's important to fallen man today is his own image. That's the only thing that's important to him is his self. His likeness, what he is and all these things. Man fell in that condition. 
You see, in Roman Catholicism, you have the setting up of idols and worshiping of images. They have worship of saints, of objects, alleged relics of the past, and so on. And they put Mary on the same level with Christ as co-matrix with Christ, meaning that she had just as much to do with the redemption of lost humanity as Christ did himself. And that's idolatry. They place these idols and place this idolatry. Any form of setting up of images, whether they be physically in the corner of your house or in your heart, those things are still an idol. And God hates idols. Man set himself up. Man put himself in this position and, and made himself a God in his own eyes. And he set himself up physically. And he set himself up with, with his idols and the idols in his heart. And the, and the excuse that man makes. You, find, you talk to anyone that is an idol worshiper and they'll tell you, no, this is not God, but it reminds me of God. They'll be always, they'll say, I know that this little concrete statue is not God, but it reminds me of God. That will always be their excuse when you say, but this, this is your little God. No, but it reminds me of God. But the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 4 that God thundered to mankind from the fiery mount of Sinai out in the mountains of Horeb. And he said to man there from the very beginning, for you saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb, out of the midst of the fire lest you corrupt yourself and make you a graven image. The similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female. You see, God knows that man in his weakness has a propensity to idolatry. You can set up any kind of an idol in your heart. We are prone to that. Given to our carnal nature, we are weak in that area. It is easy. God knew and God still knows today that it's easy for you and I to slip into idolatry. Yes. Yes. And so he says here, he said, and the likeness of any beast that is on the earth and the likeness of any winged fowl that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth. See, God did not uh, God put this prohibition on these things uh, and man still with the prohibition of God he went and worshipped all these creatures he did it anyway yeah. Christians are just as bad sometimes God will put the prohibition there and will step beyond that and go ahead and do it anyway and man, man made an idol and a God out of all the created things but he goes on to say to them lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven. And when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the hosts of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and to serve them. Deuteronomy chapter 4, 15 through 19. We lived and served in Mexico for 30 years as missionaries. We saw it firsthand how that men would bow down before idols and set up images and idols in their home. And millions of wars have been fought and millions of lives have been lost over the setting up of images. I'll tell you something else. Talking about the church, talking about the Christian, talking about the American. You see, I'm talking about the preaching of conviction. You'll know when you touch a man's idol. The preacher will know when he touches a man's idol. You know why? That man will rise up. He'll know when he's preaching. And that conviction, if he's touching something somewhere, you know what the, the doctor does when you go to him? I used to. I don't know now. But the first thing he does, he takes that finger and gouges. Doesn't he? He starts probing. He starts feeling. And when he hits what he's looking for, the person hollers, Ouch, that hurt. Yeah. Well, that's what the preaching of the gospel is. And you'll know when a man or a woman's eye has been touched. I don't care if it's a grandchild. I don't care if it's a, it's a physical thing. I don't care what it is. You'll know when you preach this word. If you probe there long enough, you'll touch that man's eye and you'll know who it is. He'll let you know. 
You won't have to guess. He'll let you know because you see, we're very protective of our idols. We're very protective of our idols. We, we will let folks know and, and we'll let them know right off. Hey, now this is, this is sacrosanct. That means you don't go there. That means you don't touch there. You see, and this is this is uh, uh, is a condition of man in his fallen state, and and in the worship of images and selling of indulgences and religion in general. All the wars of the world have been fought over religion. Oh, we give it some other idea, freedom to preserve us, you know, or, or keep the uh, the aggressor at bay. But really, when it boils down to it, there's a there's a huge element of religion in all of them. And so, a lot of lives have been lost. And God tells us He forbids in Exodus chapter twenty and verse four He forbids the making of images unto Himself or to anything else. So you see the idea that this reminds me of God. That insect doesn't remind me of God. That dog doesn't remind me of God. That animal doesn't remind me of God. That concrete statue of some, some uh, Catholic saint doesn't remind me of God. God has already forbid that. And he said in my spirit, you did not see any similar to anything like me in these things. God forbids it. God does not allow it. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, God says, I already have an image. You see, God got an image. You want to set that image and that's his son. Jesus Christ, the Bible said, is the express image. Amen. Hebrews 1 3. He is the express image yes. of the Godhead. He is the image. He is the idol. He is the, he is the figure that we are to set up Christ himself. He is God's representative and he is God's idol and he's God's express image. The failure of religion to elevate God to where he belongs has led to the teaching of humanism and that man is a God and he's in charge of his own destiny. That's humanism. And the neglecting of putting God where God belongs. I want to add a little bit to the Sunday school this morning. The songs, the hymns, the spiritual songs. They, oh yes, they thrill my soul. I'm telling you, I, I felt the presence of God this yes, morning standing right there. I felt the power of God. Tears came to my eyes when we said, I want to know more yes. about my Jesus. Yes, I, I want to know more about my Lord. Didn't have, you don't need any more in that verse. That's all. I want to know more about him, don't you? One of these days, I'm going to know him. I'm going to know him more and more and more. But until then, I've got a hunger to know him. Yes, yes. But in that, in that, that's what those songs do. But more than anything else, we must always remember that the psalms and hymns and spiritual songs are a worship and edification to God and to lift up God, to glorify God. It is a form of worship. And if we worship the flesh, the devil takes that as worship for himself. He'll take it as worship. Yes. But you give you give worship to anything but God, the devil will snatch it up and say, this is for me. He takes it. A lot of things we do, sometimes the devil takes that as worship. Oh. Let's go on. I don't even know where I am right now. <laughs> Man. Man has lifted himself up as a God. Yes, man was designed for dignity. He was designed, God designed the human race. He designed man at the beginning for dignity. He designed him for high rank, for honor and worth, but he never designed him to be equal with God. We are the image bearer, remember? We are not the image. We will never be God. No matter what we do or how we live or any of these things, but we will always be the image bearer of God. Man is never going to be equal with his creator, but in the beginning God made him sinless and in a perfect state and made man the image bearer of God on the earth. But you know, when the fall came in, yeah. the mirror was cracked. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? I don't know about you, but until I came to Christ, my mirror was broken. My mirror was cracked. I wasn't a 
decent representative for anything. I wasn't even a fit representative for the human race, let alone to be the English of God. God. And so, <clears throat> man in this perfect state before the fall, he became the barrier of God on earth. But no sooner, I don't know if some of you may believe Adam got to be an old man before he sinned. I believe it happened right off the bat. I believe it happened from the get go. But no sooner had he been created and the breath of life was breathed in him and he got up walking around and breathing life on this earth and became a living soul and was the perfect image bearer of God. There was no imperfection, no sin, no shortcomings in him. He was perfect in the sight of God. He was the image bearer of God. But when the fall came, when he sinned, man through the fall lost that glorious state of the image of God. And man no longer in that state can be the image bearer of God. You cannot bear the glory of God and have an unregenerate nature. You cannot bear the image of God. You cannot have this glory. But man failed. He no longer was the image bearer of God, but he and his wife left the garden in shame. Yes, yes. yes. Drove them out. Put that, put that <laughs> uh, a flaming fire and that sword there. And drove them out from his presence. You see, you often hear sentimental people say, somebody asked Brother Clinton at one time, he said, are you sentimental? He said, I was, but he said, I went and prayed it through. <laughs> but you'll hear sentimental folks say well but we're all the children of God that's not so that's not Bible only the redeemed are the children of God Jesus said the rest of you your father the devil and the lust of your father you'll do but we hear that sentimental are all the children of God and we're made in the image of God that's, they'll say that's what the Bible says what are they talking about when they say that, are they talking about the triune man, spirit, soul, and body? Just what do they mean by that? Because the Bible teaches us in Genesis chapter 5 and verse 1 that God created Adam in his image. And then Adam fell. And in verse 3 it tells us that Adam had a son named himself. And he said he was in Adam's likeness. In Adam's image. Well, you see, no longer. No longer could man be the image bearer. No longer could man have the glory of God on him. But now he was headed back to the dust that he came from. No longer could he bear the image of God and show forth the glories of God. And, and so uh, uh, his, he, he, his son was like him and his likeness. And from then on, the law of nature God put in man was that it was seed after his kind. No longer after God. Because you see, man in that fallen, unregenerate state is not a true image bearer of God. But now, man from seed to seed is portraying now the image of the human, the image of the fallen man. Seth was in the image of his father. And Seth's sons were the image of Seth, and down and down and down, all the way through. The fall became. Man became altogether a different creature at the fall. You see, man lost in the fall the true image of God in holiness and in sanctification. But he retained one important ability in the fall of the likeness of God. And that's why God put such a strong prohibition upon that sin. He retained the ability with God to procreate. That's why God's so hard. On adult, adultery and fornication. Come on. Because. Man. Had that ability. To bring forth offspring. In that fallen state. God stern in his warnings. And his condemnations of adultery. Because a man and woman can procreate. And the difference between a man and woman procreating than a, than, a, than a herd of hogs or horses is that that man or woman procreates a living soul. That's going to spend eternity, not in the butcher shop, but in heaven or hell. And because of 
the sanctity of human life because of disease and all of these things that were there man puts restraints on the morals of man for the for the sickness, fornication, and all these things, because man can bring forth an eternal soul. When God laid out his commandments, he did not write them in there to accommodate my sinful life. The Ten Commandments do not accommodate me at all. God simply thundered out his commandments, and then he said to man, now you do them. He didn't ask you or me if I wanted to do it. He said, this is my commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not break unto me, make unto me any graven images. Thou shalt and on and on and on. He did, these things were ten commandments, not ten recommendations. God didn't make them as recommendations. He made them as commandments. And he said, if you keep them, you'll live. If you don't, you'll die. And so man, in this condition now, what an awful, awesome responsibility that we are given. Now this is why we must govern ourselves in our walk with God. The fall of man sent him from glory back to dust. In Genesis 3, 19 it said, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. Pronounce that judgment upon man. Death. Back to the grave. Back to the dust that you come. The fall came about because Adam and Eve, with the help of the serpent, serpent refused to understand the difference between the image bearer and the image maker. You see, God's the image. He's the image maker. You and I are just image bearers. Man was just to be an image bearer of God. That God instilled his likeness in all in man. But after the fall, in man, you know, man still has that problem today. Yeah. Keep him from confusing the image from the image bearer. We still have that problem today, getting ourselves confused with God. Because of the fall, then the creature lost its ability to respond to the creator. No longer could man respond to God. He put on a bunch of fig leaves and went and hid himself. He couldn't respond. He couldn't fellowship. He couldn't have anything else to do with God. He lost his ability to respond to, to the Creator for the, and the purpose for Christ. You know, Jesus could have come and grown and in 30 days finished the work of the cross and went back to heaven. But he lived those years for one purpose, and that was to teach you and I how to live right before God. His whole purpose of staying here, his whole purpose of teaching us, and his whole purpose was to show us how to act and how to respond to God and how to know God. Yes. Yes. We see until then, we don't know how to act around God. Yes. You know, sometimes our kids, they don't know how to act around company. But you know what? We sometimes don't know how to act around God. Yes. We, we don't understand. But Christ spent all that time here. His messages, his teaching, his life, everything about it was to give you an eye of blueprint so we know how to treat God. So we know something about God. And my dark, in your dark soul, could know nothing about God until Christ Jesus, through the new birth, illuminated him to my mind and to my heart and my soul. Then I begin to understand what it's all about and I know how to behave myself. Around God. Jesus. I know how to act. I know what God likes and don't like. And, I, and I, I'm going to do my best to love the things God loves and hate the things God hates. Amen. I'm going to learn how to act around God. Well, you see, until we know how to act toward our Creator, then we do not know how to act toward one another. We do not know how to act in this world. Christ is our pattern. We do not know how to get along. We don't know what to do. But Christ and the new birth, he begins. So I'm going to quickly close in a little bit. Not only when we die do we become dust, but we are already turning now back to that dust. Yes. That's, what, that's what the aging process is about. He said from dust you came, dust you're going to go back. 
Abraham has said it so well in Genesis 18, 27. Have taken on me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Job said it like this in Job 30 and 19. I am become like dust and ashes. That's the process that we're in. That's what the process of life in this physical is all about. And with the fall from glory back to dust, man lost the image of God and was driven from his presence. God said to them in the garden when he drove them out, he said, your kind can never come back in here again. Your kind can't go to heaven. Your kind can't come back in this garden. What did he mean? The unregenerate, fallen, sinful nature of humanity, as long as a man or a woman is in that condition, they cannot get back into that garden. They cannot get back. That kind cannot come back in here again. And God set a watch over that thing. And God is saying that to us today. That's why we need regeneration. That's why we need the new birth. Because without it, we can't get back in there again. Without it, we cannot enjoy the presence and the blessings of God. We cannot get back there. Our kind will never enter there again. We must be born again. That's why folks in religion never are born again. They go through their life, but they'll never get there. Because God said to them, your kind can't come back here. In closing, I want to leave you one thought. This is the, this is the, this is the hardest problem. Not the sinner, but the Christian. This is the hardest problem you see that the Christian has. The two most important foundational stones in the gospel for the overcomer Christian is this. One is obedience to God. You will never make it as a Christian until you learn obedience to God. And there's another that's just as important. You see, you'll never, and I'll never make it as a Christian Till I learn to resist temptation. That's the two foundation stones of the gospel and of your salvation. You will never be an overcomer. You will never get anywhere in God until you learn and I learn to obey God and I learn to resist temptation. The Adam and Eve knew this. They were perfect in all of their ways in their state, but they had a problem. They disobeyed God and they fell into the temptation of the Satan. Here come Jesus. Now, here's the perfect man. Here is the, here is the second Adam. Like the first Adam, he's perfect, sinless, spotless. The only difference between him and Adam was that Christ obeyed the Father and resisted the devil. Amen. You see, a lot of people Glory stay in trouble because you know, they, they, they try to obey God. But they have a problem resisting temptation. That's a bedrock foundation of your Christian walk. Until you master those two points, you're not going anywhere in God. Until you learn. Jesus set that example. He fulfilled eternal salvation and gave eternal life to man because he obeyed God. He pleased the Father. His whole life, his whole walk, everything about it. Not my will, but thy will. I, I speak only that which I hear my father speak. I only do that which my father tells me. He lived and walked under an open heaven. heaven. That's what we need today. We just stand back. We need to live and walk under an open heaven. What does that mean? What's an open heaven? When Jesus stepped down on that shores of that bank of that river that day John looked up and said behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world he walked down and got into that river and he said John let's fulfill the righteousness I want you to baptize me no no Lord I, I mean no he said you baptize me for so it fulfills all righteousness and the Bible said that when he come out of that water we're talking about having the Spirit we're talking about being led by the Spirit remember the Sunday school lesson this morning talking about having the Spirit but you will have to obey God, and you're going to have to get to a place where you can live and walk under an open heaven. When Jesus come up out of that watery grave, John's baptism, the Bible said the heavens opened. The heavens opened. And the Spirit of God descended on him and lit on him. And from that point on, Jesus walked 
in obedience to God and resisted temptation. And you and I can have that same open heavenly spirit that will only come as we obey God and resist that tempter. The difference between you and I and the problem we have with the tempter is when Jesus was faced with the tempter, he saw the devil. You and I, when we're faced with temptation, we only see the bait and the trap. We don't see who set the trap. Yeah, that's right. But Jesus walked Jesus. under that open heaven. And the rest of his life until the cross, he pleased God. Not himself. He pleased God. You want to be an overcomer? You want to live victorious in your Christian life? You're going to have to build those two foundations in your Christian walk. And that's obedience first to God. And resist that devil. The devil can't make you do it. But you can resist that tempter. Jesus resisted him. And brought eternal life. And salvation to you and I. Now. We. When we are born again. We now become the image bearers of God through Christ. For whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to his son, the image of his son. The whole purpose and plan. You see, the early church knew something that most Christians don't know today. They knew that God's work of salvation was to redeem a people that would represent Jesus, that would look like Christ, act like Christ, that was that's the whole work of salvation. Leave everything else, nothing else to matter. The whole work and plan of salvation was that God worked in man to redeem man, that man might now bear the image of Christ. Yes. Lord, we talked about that, didn't we? Yes. In the lesson, bear the image of Christ. I don't know what your custom is or anything. I've been here enough to day in and day out. But I, if you'd like to, come meet me in these altars for a few minutes. If you've got to go, understand it. But I like to pray. And allow God's word to get a hold of us. Come on, brother. Allow God's word to take the message and deal with us in our hearts and our lives. I know some folks have to go. But those who would, would you meet me in the altar and let's seek God for a little while. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise Blessed God. be the name of the Lord. Oh, Lord, Lord Jesus, we thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. God, we thank you. Lord, seek your face. Pray one for another. Thank you. Pray for ourselves. Pray.